This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. Frank Superfly Lucas is one of the most storied African-American gangsters of all time. And when I say storied, I mean it. Almost every story about Frank Lucas is disputed in some way, if not entirely. Even the movie American Gangster, which was supposedly based on a true story of his life, has been called 99% Hollywood and 1% reality. We're going to take a look at all of the angles of these different stories in today's episode. But one thing is certain. He made millions peddling his blue magic heroin in Harlem in the late 60s and early 70s. So how did he do it? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we are going to look at the life and times of Frank Lucas. We're going to look at his childhood and how his attack of a former employer forced him to flee for his life to New York. We're going to look at his life in Harlem and how he got hooked up with gangster Bumpy Johnson, which was his introduction to organized crime and the mob. We're going to talk about how he branched away from the mob and sourced his own heroin out of Southeast Asia in what was dubbed the Cadaver Connection wherein Lucas claimed he was smuggling heroin in caskets of American servicemen whose bodies were being shipped back from Vietnam. We're going to talk about the good times and we're going to talk about the bad times when he got busted by the authorities. Then we're going to talk about how his cooperation led law enforcement to the conviction of over a hundred different criminals and to the making of the movie American Gangster starring Denzel Washington. All that and more in today's episode. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button. And you guys know it. I love it when you share my videos on social media. As most of you know, Lawyer Up has partnered with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy or sell stocks or crypto or whatever you're into directly from your computer or the mobile app on your phone. Webull is free to join, it's free to use, so there's no cost to buy or sell. It's commission-free trading. Better yet, when you sign up and you link a bank account and deposit as little as one cent, Webull will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 per share. So it's free money as well. And in March, at the time that this video is being filmed, you get five free stocks right now. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Webull traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below this video to sign up. Happy trading. So let's talk about Frank Superfly Lucas. Frank Lucas was born on September 9th of 1930 and was raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. Lucas grew up in a very poor family, and at age six, he witnessed the KKK gun down his 12-year-old cousin Obadiah for allegedly recklessly eyeballing a Caucasian woman. From there, he attended school only briefly, never learning to read or write, and drifted through a life of petty crime until he got a job at a pipe company. It was there that he met the owner's daughter and began courting her for a spell. That continued until Frank and her dad got into a fight at the pipe factory, wherein Frank used what he had available, a pipe, to knock the father unconscious. He then stole $400 from the till and burned the place to the ground. And it was at that point that he really had no option other than to flee from North Carolina. It was 1946, and Lucas had heard rumors his whole life that Harlem, a neighborhood in Upper Manhattan, which was primarily populated by African Americans at that time, was a magical place. So he headed to New York City. Once he settled in Harlem, he began a life of hustling unsuspecting drunks at pool halls, 
robbing bars, and stealing from jewelry stores. Until the age of 17, when he ran across gangster Bumpy Johnson. Ellsworth Raymond Bumpy Johnson was a crime boss in Harlem. Like Lucas, he had fled the South in fear of a lynch mob after his older brother was accused of killing a white man. His nickname, Bumpy, was derived from a bump he had on the back of his head. Bumpy was into peddling heroin for the New York mob, and that was until 1952 when he was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison, the majority of which would be spent at Alcatraz. Bumpy would ultimately be released, but then died of a heart attack in 1968 while eating dinner at a restaurant. Frank Lucas would say that he was Bumpy Johnson's driver for 15 years, although it turns out that story is impossible because Bumpy was in prison for 10 of those years. And Bumpy's wife would also say that Frank's story was only partially true, which seems to be a reoccurring theme with the stories that we hear from Mr. Lucas. Regardless, prior to his death, Bumpy had been dealing heroin in Harlem. Frank Lucas had been learning from him and familiarizing himself with the Harlem underworld. So when Bumpy died, Lucas was more than ready to step into his role. And it was the 60s in the United States. The civil rights movement was going on, the Vietnam War, and hippies, they were normalizing the recreational use of drugs. And in the Northeast, at least, there was a large demand for heroin, especially in Harlem. In fact, during the 60s, heroin use increased tenfold in New York. So this was the world that Frank Lucas was operating in in the late 60s and early 70s in Harlem. Now, the trouble from Frank's perspective was that the main supply of wholesale heroin was controlled by the Italian-American mafia, or the mob, there in New York through their famed French Connection. Now, everybody has heard of the French Connection, but not everybody really understands it. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the French island of Corsica, off the southern coast of France, has had a significant criminal element for over a hundred years. Originally made famous by Paul Carbone and Francois Sparito, the Corsican Mafia really rose to prominence and power during World War II by stealing capital and assets and weapons and vehicles from the Germans during their occupation of France. Now, following World War II, Marseille, a major trading port in southern France, had a pro-Soviet mayor and was controlled by Soviet labor unions and longshoremen and dock workers. The French government, as well as the United States government, considered this communist influence to be a threat to democracy in what was the beginnings of the Cold War. France, not wanting to start a civil war, and the United States, not wanting to formally invade an ally's turf, needed someone to take action to disrupt the union gatherings, their elections, and generally just cause problems for the pro-Soviet regime in Marseille. Alas, a partnership was born between the United States CIA and the Corsican Mafia. Originally, the deal in the 1950s was that these Mafia members would be protected from prosecution for their actions in Marseille. But in the 60s, they upped their price and forged a deal where they would also be allowed to ship heroin to the United States for distribution. And the U.S. CIA would protect the shipments at least until they got to the U.S. shores. This arrangement is what is referred to in history as the, quote, French Connection. You have probably heard about the Gene Hackman film, The French Connection. It's considered one of the best movies ever made, and it's fiction. However, its characters are based on real-life New York City narcotics detectives and Corsican mob members. Anyway, the raw opium came primarily from Turkey, where it was refined into heroin in Corsican labs. And while the transportation of heroin from Corsica to the United States had been going on prior to this time, with the official sanction of the CIA, it ramped up significantly in the 60s and comprised the vast majority of heroin coming into the United States, with its main distribution connection being the mob in New York. 
So at that time, you had the American mob importing heroin from their French connection. You also had fellow African-American Frank Matthews, who, after having his request to partner with the mob shot down, teamed up with the Cuban mafia to source heroin and cocaine. And you had Frank Lucas, who was stepping into Bumpy's role and who would at first continue peddling heroin for the mob, but who also realized that to be truly successful, he would need to obtain his own independent source of supply. So to really increase profits, he needed to cut out the middleman and cut out the mob. So like with Harlem, Frank had always heard that Southeast Asia was the best source of opium and heroin. So Lucas boarded a plane and headed to Bangkok, Thailand, which is located in the Golden Triangle area of Southeast Asia, an area notorious for heroin production. There he found himself at Jack's American State Bar, a local hangout for off-duty African-American soldiers. It was at this bar that he met U.S. Army Sergeant Leslie Ike Atkinson, who was also originally from North Carolina and who was actually married to one of Lucas's cousins. From there, a partnership was born, wherein Ike Atkinson, a.k.a. Sergeant Smack, assisted Frank Lucas in smuggling heroin into the United States from Southeast Asia between 1968 and 1975. Now, the extent of this relationship is disputed. Lucas said that they had a very involved relationship, while Ike has said they worked together occasionally, and then later said he didn't even know the guy. So who knows what the truth really is? Anyway, as the story goes, the two took a trip through the jungle that lasted several days, but when they emerged, Frank Lucas gazed upon poppy fields and heroin farms as far as the eye could see. It was in that moment he knew that he could cut out the mafia as his middleman. So here is what they did. Frank said that he had a fella by the name of Leon, a carpenter from North Carolina and a lifelong friend of Ike's, flown to Bangkok. There he made 28 replicas of government coffins, except that these had false bottoms with enough room to hold about 6 to 8 kilograms of heroin. That's 12 to 16 pounds for you Americans. From there, they would line the bottom of these coffins filled with dead American soldiers coming back from Vietnam with heroin. The DEA dubbed their smuggling scheme the, quote, cadaver connection. Frank said that they had to pack it tight so it didn't shift around and that they also had to put the heroin in the coffins of heavier soldiers so there was no suspicion about any added weight. Lucas would also later say that he would clear no less than $300,000 per kilo, and if you do the math, that's over $2 million dollars per coffin that was sent home. Now, Ike would later totally dispute this claim. He would say that he had Leon hollow out teak furniture to smuggle the heroin and that he only told Lucas that he was using coffins but never actually did so. A Lucas biographer would later say that there was good evidence that they did use coffins on at least one occasion. Regardless of the medium of transportation, heroin was flowing into Harlem. Lucas would say that in total he imported more than $50 million worth of heroin and was making over a million dollars a day selling it although investigators who would later unravel his finances would say that was a gross exaggeration. Now, as opposed to most high-end drug smugglers who would get other people to peddle their product, Frank Lucas was known to walk out on 116th Street and sell it for himself. In fact, he only used trusted relatives and close friends from North Carolina to work in his organization. These country boys, as they were called, peddled Frank's product, nicknamed Blue Magic, known to be at least 98% pure straight from Thailand. Special Prosecutor Sterling Johnson stated that Lucas's organization was, quote, one of the most outrageous international dope smuggling operations ever. 
He called Lucas a, quote, innovator who created his own connections outside of the United States and sold the narcotics himself on the street. So life was good in the late 60s and early 70s for Frank Lucas. He had a lot of the police on his payroll as well as his connections with the mob. So he had almost the perfect setup. In an interview, Lucas said, quote, I wanted to be rich. Donald Trump rich. And so help me God, I made it. And while the exact totals of the enterprise are disputed, he was rich. He purchased property all over the country in Detroit, LA, Miami, a huge cattle ranch in North Carolina. He owned property in Puerto Rico, which is where his wife was from. And he stashed extra cash in an offshore bank account in Grand Cayman. He spent money on mink and chinchilla coats and was known to hang out with Howard Hughes in Harlem and Diana Ross and Muhammad Ali in Las Vegas, where he was also known to party and launder a little bit of money. In fact, Lucas would say that his downfall was wearing his $100,000 chinchilla coat to a Muhammad Ali fight. Superfly, as he was now known, had his photo from that night featured in Ebony Magazine, and he had immediately drawn the attention of law enforcement because he had better seats than both Diana Ross and Frank Sinatra that night. Lucas would say, I left that fight a marked man. True enough. And even though he had a large number of New York City police officers on his payroll, he couldn't buy Richie Roberts, the nosy New York City cop who would ultimately take him down. Now, it took a while, but in January of 1975, Lucas's home in New Jersey was raided by federal agents. No drugs were found, but they did recover over half a million dollars in cash. Now, Lucas would say they actually took over $11 million and only accounted for the half million dollars so they could pocket the rest of it. But this has never been proven. He would be charged and convicted in both state and federal court for drug violations and sentenced to a total of 70 years in prison. However, he immediately began working with law enforcement to provide information that allegedly led to the arrest of over 100 different drug dealers, corrupt policemen, and members of the mob. His reward was to have his 70-year sentence reduced to time served and a lifetime of parole after only about 15 years behind bars. He was then released into the Witness Protection Program. Now, Ike Atkinson, his downfall also came in 1975. So his plan was to ship some heroin to an elderly black woman and then to have an army serviceman go over and pick it up as a mistaken delivery. Unfortunately, the scheme was derailed when the woman got spooked and called the police thinking that the package was a bomb. In the end, Atkinson was arrested and ultimately sentenced to 15 years. Ike was actually able to continue to move heroin from prison with the complicity of other inmates and correctional officers. Ultimately, he was released in 2007 and died in 2014 at the age of 88. As for Lucas, despite a second chance at life in the Witness Protection Program, he was busted in 1984 for possession of heroin that sent him back to prison. Interestingly and shockingly, in one of those truth is stranger than fiction stories, his nemesis cop, Richie Roberts, would move on from law enforcement, graduate law school, and then later befriend and defend Frank Lucas as his attorney. Roberts would also be named Lucas's children's godfather, and both claim to have become the best of friends over the years. Quite wacky. Lucas was released from prison in 1991 and from there has basically avoided any further run-ins with the law. Lucas's life was dramatized in the 2007 film American Gangster, wherein he was portrayed by Denzel Washington. In an interview, Lucas expressed his excitement about the film and loved Washington's portrayal of him. The film is admittedly fiction and even Lucas has said only a small portion of the film actually occurred. The prosecutor 
from his original case would call the movie 99% Hollywood, stating that, quote, the real-life Lucas was illiterate, violent, and vicious. Everything Denzel Washington was not. The New York Post reported that Lucas received $800,000 and a small house in exchange for the rights to the movie. The movie was well-received by critics, but not everyone loved the film. Three DEA agents actually filed lawsuits against Universal, stating that the movie defamed them. Those lawsuits were ultimately dismissed by the court. During his lifetime, Lucas was married to Julie Ferriott, who was also convicted for her role in Lucas's criminal enterprise and who spent five years in prison. Lucas fathered seven children during his lifetime, one of which started an organization called Yellow Brick Roads, which provides resources for the children of imprisoned parents. In his last years, Lucas was confined to a wheelchair after a serious injury sustained in a car accident. He died in May of 2019 at the age of 88 in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. So that is the episode. I hope you guys have enjoyed exploring the life and times of Frank Superfly Lucas, American Gangster. If you enjoyed the episode, do me a favor, hit that like button for me. If you got something to say, you got a question, put it in the comment sections below. And if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button now, man. Help me out. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. My name is Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.